that if you do run into more acute energy shortages, you know, we, we don't do sufficient energy capex and say, for example, we have a, a major multi-year sustained bull market in energy prices, or AI does not live up to the um, productivity gains that the bulls expect, for example, and doesn't offset some of the inflation enough, then you can get more acute issues where you get things like yield curve control, uh, you get major currency devaluation relative to commodities or relative to consumer prices. Uh, and you basically get a restructuring of the debt. I mean, there's, there's, there's two major ways to default on debt. One is you can default on it just outright. And the other one is you basically print the difference where you technically give all the units back, but all those units buy a lot less than they could before. Experts are quite divided about what the future holds for the United States economy, especially how we move from the current unsustainable fiscal path. Since mid-September, the U.S. national debt has grown by $1.2 trillion and almost $7 trillion since February 2020, and more than doubled over the past 12 years. For more clarity, just four decades ago, the national debt was hovering around $907 billion, meaning it took over 200 years to pile up the first trillion dollars in debt and less than 50 years to pile on the next $33 trillion. While everyone admits that we have a huge debt problem that must immediately be handled, experts cannot seem to agree on possible solutions to the rapidly growing problem. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell, for example, acknowledges that the US is on an unsustainable fiscal path, but he believes that politicians only need to have an adult conversation about the problem to arrive at a solution. For some macro analysts and prominent investors, there is no solution to the problem. People in this category strongly believe the U.S. is already in a debt spiral and heading for a lasting downfall. While these people recognize that there might be solutions, like severe austerity programs, they are rightfully convinced that no U.S. politician will be bold enough to suggest or even back such programs. During a recent interview with Skybridge Capital's Anthony Scaramucci, Lynn Alden, a renowned macro guru and investment strategist, gives two likely outcomes for the U.S. debt problem. Alden's first outcome is one where there is enough technological development leading to adequate deflationary pressure and increased productivity that will be massive enough to take on the debt load. This scenario has also recently been touted by Real Vision CEO Raul Pal. This scenario sees the US continue to coast along despite the debt issues until artificial intelligence helps resolve the underlying problems of productivity and population decline. Alden's second scenario is QE to infinity, with the Fed printing massively to pay its debt. But this only means further currency devaluation and rapid loss of value. During the discussion with Anthony, Alden delves further into the US debt situation and how investors can stay afloat in all scenarios. As we bring you clips from the interview, please like and share this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more videos like this. Thanks and enjoy the video. The central bank and the, and the fiscal, the federal government of the United States, irresponsible with the money, is it now time to take the keys away from those people and put it into this decentralized technology? I think the incentives are all there to do so, yes. I, mean, I think people are going to be inclined towards whatever's the stronger money, especially if it's of a similar or faster speed than the weaker money. So, for example, over the past century, the biggest comparison was, say, gold and the dollar, whereas gold obviously held its value a lot better than the dollar, but the dollar had various advantages of speed and convenience. And so even though the dollar was, was weaker, it was still stable enough that especially when you combine you know, legal monopolies and legal tender laws, things like that, that the dollar was able to win out. One thing that's interesting about Bitcoin is that it's uh, over the long term, it grows even less than gold in terms of su new supply. So it's even scarcer than gold and it can move around as fast or faster than fiat currencies can. Uh, and so that's a really compelling long term story to get people to gravitate towards it uh, and change some of the structure. Although, if, uh, you know, in my view, that's a that's a multi decade story. That's not like a, you know, one decade or a two decade story. It takes very long time to, you know, change these gigantic structures. And one thing that's notable about the Bretton Woods era is that, you know, a lot of focus is on that 1971 decision to, to leave it. But what what the evidence shows that was breaking basically throughout the 60s. Um, you know, the Bretton Woods system, it was decided upon in 1944, it was implemented in 1946, but then it wasn't really even fully implemented until the late 1950s. That's when they undid some of the kind of the post-war era uh, controls that were in place. And that's when they actually started that, that overall process. And from that point, the amount of gold reserves went straight down. 
And that's partially because we were running significant deficits. And it's also partially because banks, fractional reserve banks were lending more dollars into existence and they were not constrained by the amount of gold in the system. So you had an environment where, you know, from 1950 to 1970, the broad money supply tripled as gold reserves diminished. And so the system was, it was inherently unstable to begin with. It was always a rational decision to redeem some of those ever inflating dollars for gold until they were going to run out of gold. And so we kind of have this story where we centralize everything and then over over a matter of decades, that centralized entity fails, partially because it was just unstably designed to begin with. It was kind of, you know, it, it was like great while it lasted, but it was designed not to last is the challenge. Right. Uh, and, and, and you make an interesting point because it decentralized things or more anti-fragile than centralized things. I think we both agree with that, right? Yeah. And so, for example, if you look at the history of the dollar, it was defined in, in 1792. And from there all the way up until the early uh, 1900s, uh, its purchasing power remained unchanged. Uh, it could buy the same amount of gold. It could buy the same amount of general goods and services based on most estimates. You know, during wars, there'd be some period of inflation, but then it would kind of revert back after the war. Um, and it wasn't until this more modern era where we began centralizing everything uh, and growing the money supply on average at a faster rate, that we started to get this devaluation. And to your point about who it affects or who it helps most, basically, it's it's kind of the economy is kind of like a game of blackjack, where with blackjack, you want to get close to 21, but you don't want to go over. Uh, and the way that who, who best is rewarded in this economy is people that have debt, but not so much that they blow up in a recession. So if you are if you have long-term low interest rate debt and you're using it to buy scarcer assets, you know, real estate, business, you know, cash flow, business equity, things like that, uh, the closer you are to the source of money creation, you're, you're shorting the fiat currency that everybody else is uh, earning their wages in and saving their near-term money in, and you're buying scarcer assets and you're doing very good, especially because you have global arbitrage. You can short one currency and buy assets somewhere else, for example. Whereas if you're if you're on the other side of the spectrum and you're, you know, you don't have a lot of access to credit and you and you're just kind of earning wages, you're saving a little bit, you're getting constantly devalued. You're getting paid in melting ice cubes. The problem of currency debasement is currently more debilitating in emerging economies, but Alden reckons it's only a matter of time before it spreads around the globe. Several emerging countries around the globe, from Nigeria to Egypt, Lebanon, Argentina, Sri Lanka and Zimbabwe are battling devastating inflation levels and unbelievable currency debasement rates. According to Alden, this could be the reality of many developed countries in only a matter of years as long as governments keep printing indiscriminately. By the time that happens, Alden envisions that the currencies that are already at that point today would have been completely wiped out, and what we consider strong currencies today will only be worth a fraction of their current value. Plus, there is no avoiding or hiding from currency devaluation. Whether you invest in traditional asset classes like stocks or bonds, run a small business, or depend on your wages to support your family, the struggle is always how to catch up with the devaluation rate, something many people never achieve. This is why Alden and Anthony strongly recommend investing in Bitcoin, a decentralized, trustless, and permissionless network, as opposed to the highly centralized, permissioned traditional finance system. Here are more clips from the interview. There's really no other way that uh, other than to continue monetizing it. And that's the problem. So, for example, the Fed is interesting in the sense that they, when things get really extreme, they lose control. So, for example, the 1940s during the war era, they were just overtaken by the Treasury. They were forced to monetize uh, the deficits and to keep them at low interest rates. And you know, in the past couple of years, when we had you know these extreme uh, events in various ways, they just jumped in and monetized it right away. And so they can they can try to be independent when things are going reasonably well. But as soon as you have a problem in the sovereign bond market or one of those adjacent markets, they always jump in. And so one thing that's interesting is that during COVID, Powell asked for more fiscal support. He said, look, our tools are kind of exhausted. We need more fiscal. But you don't really see the opposite happening now. You don't see him coming out and saying, look, we're trying to tighten. Um, but these very large fiscal deficits are outside of our control. And if you want to more sustainably get inflation under control, you'd have to reduce those deficits. That's that's a fiscal decision. And you don't really see him doing that. And so I think one thing the Fed could do is say, look, I mean, our tools are mostly designed to affect the rate of bank lending. 
So we have tools that can kind of incentivize or promote the rate of bank lending, which is generally pro-growth or pro-inflation. We can slow down the rate of bank lending, which helps reduce inflation or help kind of slow things down. But if you're running very, very large deficits, that's going around our tools. And that's that's largely outside of our purview. And that's mostly a, a fiscal problem. So a lot of my emphasis is pointing out that you know, in some ways, regardless of what the Fed does, it's largely a long-term fiscal spiral that we're going through. And even if you look at the Congressional Budget Office's long-term projections, it's just large and larger deficits as, I, as far as the eye can see. And then you get that negative feedback loop where if the Fed actually tries to raise rates to slow down inflation. They exacerbate the deficit because there's so much debt relative to the size of the economy, and therefore the interest expense goes up. And the spiral. And then they issue more debt to, to pay the interest. And so it's, it's largely the, the source of the concern now, I would say, is emanating from the fiscal side. Uh, could we fix it? Is there a long-term plan uh, that we could fix the situation? Yeah, I think the challenge there is that the fixes are would be so unpopular that those trying to fix it would be voted out, and then they go back right. to not fixing it. So, for example, uh, the demographics are such that the you know things like Social Security and Medicare are not long term sustainable as designed. They were designed in a different era. They weren't designed with the idea that population growth would eventually slow down and that, that the society would become very aged. So, if you look at, for example, how many workers pay into Social Security for every retiree. Uh, that number keeps uh, shrinking over time, where it becomes a very big burden for the small number of workers paying in. Um, and retirement age, you know, was originally around the average human life expectancy. So some people didn't even make it to there. Some people went over. Uh, but in general, there weren't people kind of uh, uh, living on those benefits for many decades. Whereas in recent decades, our life expectancy has gone up quite a bit, but our retirement age has, has gone up at a slower pace. And so there's that ratio of, of longer um, uh, periods of receiving support. Uh, and so you have this thing where it's, it's, it's just economically unsustainable. Also, I mean, the way that we structure our healthcare system and, and kind of the, the health problems we have, um, you know, related to diet and things like that have kind of blown out the deficit on the Medicare side as well. Um, at, arguably as big or bigger as, as Social Security. And so without kind of fixing the, the, the um, overall long-term balance of those, it's very hard to get the deficit under control. According to Lynn Alden, the many challenges facing the economy now began rearing their heads in the 80s as the national debt surpassed the dreaded $1 trillion mark. Alden reckons there would have been bigger consequences of the rapidly growing debt somewhere along the line, but due to some factors, the US economy was able to remain buoyant enough to keep the size of the economy above the interest expenses on the country's rapidly growing debts. These factors include rapid globalization, a profound period of productivity with about a billion people entering the global labor force, lower interest rates, and peak demographics in the United States, with the large baby boomer generation entering their peak spending years in the 80s and 90s. As a result of these factors, Alden says policymakers have been able to kick the can so far down the road, and there have been no serious consequences until now. Now those problems are re-emerging, only bigger and much worse because of the much larger debt-to-GDP ratio. However, unlike the 80s and 90s, all the factors that help the economy stay afloat are either unraveling fast or happening at a much slower pace than they did back then. The result, Alden explains, is that the US economy is now in a very precarious situation and tilting on the very edge of disaster. Alden recommends that investors protect themselves against the coming crisis by investing in Bitcoin one of the few assets that have significantly outperformed currency debasement and will continue to. What are your thoughts on Lynn Alden's assessment of the current state of the United States economy and what's coming? Please drop your comments and observations in the comments section below. Also, ensure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more videos like this. Thanks for watching.